forming of the early church, Acts chapter 2, beginning with verse 40. Uh, and uh, speaking of Peter, and he testified with them many other arguments and exhorted them, saying, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. So those who welcomed his message were baptized. And that day, about 3,000 persons were added. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. And awe came upon everyone because many wonders and signs were being done by the apostles. All who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> you they're, they're all together and then they pool their resources and they do miraculous things. You see, giving is at the center of life. When we give, we live. You see that in the early church. They gave together and they were alive and it was magnetic. It's not a minor theme in the Bible. It's one that is found from the beginning to the end of the gospel. You and I would invite you to take a brief walk with me through just a few of the biblical passages. I'd like to start with Genesis chapter 2 where the human beings are, are created in the image of God and then they are called by God to be stewards of the earth. Stewards of the earth. In other words, they were called not just to be takers on earth, but to be givers and caretakers. I used to go to a barber a long time ago, Bill the Barber. He was kind of a barber shop philosopher. One day, uh, a fellow walked past his window, kind of a, guy, a cool guy around town. And uh, Bill saw him outside, and he just shook his head. And he turned to me and philosophically said, Andrew, there are two kinds of people in this world, givers and takers. And the message was clear. Don't be taken in by the takers. Be a giver. God called the human beings to be stewards of the earth, not just takers but caretakers who give of ourselves. That's just the first couple chapters in the Bible. Go on to the second book of the Bible in Exodus, and you see in chapter 16, you've got these people who have been enslaved for 400 years, and they took the risk of, of, of walking out of slavery. They took uh, the risk of running away from Pharaoh. And there they are now in the wilderness. And they say, God, we're starving. And Moses turns to God and says, what am I supposed to do? And God says, I will provide manna. Now this is a book that, uh, this is a word that doesn't show up in any of the other ancient literature. Manna. Nobody knows what God is talking about when God says, I will, pro I will provide manna. The closest really I mean, the Bible translates it bread, but really the closest that we can have for cognate words is stuff. God will provide stuff. And there it is. It's, it's on the ground all around them. And people say, what is that stuff? And someone says, I don't know, but I'm not going to touch that stuff. And someone else says, I, you should try and eat that stuff. He says, I'm not going to eat that stuff. I'm not going to eat that stuff. Give it to Mikey. Mikey will eat that stuff. Mikey eats it and he smiles and says it's good. And then everybody says, give me some of that stuff. Hey, this is good stuff. God, thank you for all this stuff. What that message is about is God provides all this stuff 
what we need when we're in the wilderness, when we've taken the risk of, of walking out of slavery and into a new day, God provides. Theologically, we call it providence. It just means God provides. Some way, somehow, God provides when we're in the wilderness. And therefore, we as people of faith at the center of our life have a sense of trust. A sense of trust. That when we leave the shackles behind, even though it may be a long road in the wilderness, we trust that God will provide. Because that's the heart of our faith experience. That God is a giver who provides what we need. Giving in the Bible is also about making promises. God uh, promises uh, to 80-year-old Abraham and Sarah, these two people who had no hope, no future, no one to care for them in their old age, no, no, no real way of seeing what's going to happen, and yet God promises. What ends up happening is a fascinating series of stories, but you see that Abraham and Sarah had been generous to some strangers who had passed by. They had provided uh, food for them. They'd, they'd set a feast of a table, and, and it ended up being angels that they were providing for. They fed angels unaware, and therefore they entertained God and cared for God. And God makes a promise to these two octogenarians. He says, I will bless you to be a blessing. I will bless you to be a blessing to all the earth. And you will have offspring as many as the stars of the heavens. You, you, you know, right? At the top of your sanctuary here, you've got stars. You've got stars because you're children of Abraham. We're all children of Abraham and we have been given that same promise. You will be given the power to be a blessing to all the earth. You will be blessed to be a blessing. Now remember, to be who you are. It's in your theological DNA. You are the offspring of Abraham and Sarah, blessed to be a blessing. Now be that blessing and be grateful to God for the blessings that you have received. Of course, that is our identity but sometimes we don't live out our identity as, as much as we think we do. Things can get in the way of our living out of that sense of our having the power to be a blessing to others. Maybe you know the story about the woman who thinks her husband is losing his hearing. She decides to do an experiment. He's reading the paper in the living room, so she stands in the kitchen and says, Can you hear me? There's no answer. She comes to the doorway and says, Can you hear me? No answer. She comes to the middle of the room where he is and says, Can you hear me? No answer. Finally, she stands right behind him and says, Can you hear me? And he says, For the fourth time, yes. <laughs> well, sometimes... When God calls us, we think we've answered, but we really have not. We know that, that sometimes we, we, we were just sure that we had responded when God called. You know, psychologists do studies on this. They, they have studied, they ask people how much they gave over the course of a year and people write down what they think they gave, and then they say, uh, now, would you please find the receipts uh, to prove that? And what they end up finding is consistently people estimate far more than they actually gave. Uh, it's just human nature. We think a lot of ourselves. But God calls, and the question is, have we really answered? I think Jesus called his followers disciples because the root word of disciple is discipline. Uh, you discipline yourself to grow into the kind of person 
you hope to become. Uh, you discipline yourself uh, like, a, like a weightlifter. You, you, you lift these weights more and more each day to, to try and grow into that strong person. Uh, well, in the church, you don't have to lift a 500-pound barbell. All you have to do is lift a pledge card. That's a spiritual discipline. Generosity comes from disciplined disciples who practice in disciplined ways, becoming the generous people that we really want to be, that we really feel blessed to be and called to be. The church helps us with the spiritual discipline called a pledge card. Giving's a way of expressing the freedom that we feel because we feel so loved by God. Galatians says, for freedom Christ has set us free. Not to be drawn into the culture around us that tries to convince us that, that we've got to keep up with everybody else. One of my former churches had a pastor who preached a sermon called Keeping Up with the Dow Joneses. <laughs> and you know, I don't know how much power that influenced that congregation because they realized in the course of that sermon that the Dow Jones kept going up and their stock portfolios kept going up and their church pledge kept staying the same. Uh, it's up to us to be disciplined disciples and each year to say, how am I pushing myself to grow in my spiritual discipline of generosity? I want to be a generous people, a generous person. It is so moving to me. Uh, I do a lot of funerals over the course of my life, and I ask families to tell me about their loved ones and to hear how many times I hear these good people of the church and their families say they were so generous. That just moves me every time. Because I know that they were generous in all sorts of ways because they practiced being that kind of person. For freedom, Christ has set us free, to be free with our generosity. 2 Corinthians has a passage that is usually translated, God loves a cheerful giver. You've heard that one, God loves a cheerful giver. But I think it was Frederick Beekner who said a better translation is, God loves a hilarious giver. You know, I, I want to say, give until you laugh because you've gotten in touch with how free you are. Uh, I laughed last night. I, uh, I got the church newsletter from my old uh, congregation in Lincoln, Nebraska. Before I left, uh, we'd had a, uh, a missionary, one of our Presbyterian missionaries, come in, and he digs wells in Africa. He used to be a professor at Duke uh, University, and he gave that up and has gone to Africa, and for the last couple decades, he has been digging wells. And uh, when he does that, who knows how many lives are saved with each well that he digs because the water is cleaner and because Presbyterians stick with a village for 10 years, helping coach them and to know why it matters that they use this well and how to keep it clean and all those things. Well, before I left, I was so moved by this missionary, I said to the, uh, I said to the congregation, you know, we ought to dig 10 wells. <laughs> and then I left. <clears throat> and I... Um, looked at the newsletter last night and they said that they had surpassed that 10 well goal. When people come together in the church, these miracles happen. It's amazing what happens when people are generous together in the church. The Gospel uh, of Luke 
tells a story that Jesus has about a corrupt manager. And what that story is about is saying, you know, <laughs> sometimes we feel like, well, we shouldn't talk about money. That's, that's really a secular thing. And we're supposed to be spiritual. But, but Jesus wasn't spiritual in that sense. He was flesh and, flesh and bone and blood and sweat and tears. And he did disciplined things in his life to embody love and that's what we do when we pledge and give to the church of Jesus Christ we embody that with a sense of of who we are being lived out with what we do giving makes love real and Jesus is God's way of showing that God's love is real uh, that's what the incarnation is all about, and, and in our pledging, that's our way of showing that we are real. It's one of the many ways, but an important one uh, that we do. So this church, this old stone church, what do we do as the body of Christ? We build bonds of loving community, and that's why we love getting together and seeing each other. We feed the hungry. That's why we find these ways to, to, to generate more food so people can be hungry. And we welcome so people won't be hungry. We, we welcome the stranger. That's why this congregation is this marvelous, diverse congregation that has all these folks who are different and who come to love and appreciate each other because we think God has created everybody in God's image. And we build homes for the poor. And I want to say thank you to Dorothy Bonick and Janet uh, Lauder Kincaid and the Mission and Urban Wellness Group and the 200, for the 200 Homes Project because they've planted this seed for you to find a way to help build 200 homes. How that's going to happen, I don't know. There are some plans. They're working on it. How long is that going to take? I don't know. But it is this vision, this dream, this calling that you get to help be part of when you pledge to the church. And if you want to cure homelessness, build homes. That is the one best thing that you can do. It makes more of a difference than anything else. Build homes. And that's what this congregation has pledged itself to do. It's one of those things that we do where we make our love real. Giving is living. Take a look at the book of Acts. They do all these miracles, these miraculous things, and they have an impact on one another by their giving. It's, it's a church that's loving and committed and generous, and there's 3,000 people that join in, in one day. I, sometimes I wonder if maybe there's a little hyperbole going on there. But I don't know. I do know that people who are loving are attractive. No matter who they are, when you are a loving church, you are attractive. And the Holy Spirit makes the most of people's love and generosity. The company we keep shapes us because we have an impact on one another. Hebrews 10 says... We should inspire one another with love and good works. That's what the church does at its best. We inspire one another with love and good works. One of my grammar books in college was Strunken White's Elements of Style. Maybe some of you use that also. But they had three principles for writing. Uh, uh, for, for writing. It said, be clear, be brief, be bold. Um, and it went on in one of the passages to say, and if you don't know how to pronounce a word, say it loud. Why compound ignorance with inaudibility? <laughs> That's just funny. So I want to invite you over this next week, if you haven't made your pledge next week, and we'll come and we'll share them together in worship as we bring it forward uh, here. And, and that is such an inspiring moment just to see people witnessing to their generosity. But when you make your pledge, be clear, be brief, be bold. And if you can't give a lot, at least write your pledge really large. <laughs> 
That's a first step towards generosity. Because when the church practices bold generosity, the Holy Spirit generates power to shape the church and to reshape the world. As members pool their resources, they experience inspiration. Inspiration. It's the Spirit moving and miraculous things happen. Old Stone Church is built on the faithful generosity of its members. Previous generations have come before us and they have paved the way, paved the way in, in strength. But now it's our time. Now it's our time to do our part. Every pledge matters. It ensures the inspiration that will happen in this congregation. Like my barber, Bill, my, my barber Bill said, there's two kinds of people, givers and takers. God has called us clearly to be givers in ways that other people experience as nothing less than miraculous. Amen. Thanks for watching our video. Make sure to subscribe to get the latest and greatest videos from the Old Stone Church. And if you feel blessed by our message, please go to theoldstonechurch.org and click to donate. God bless you today and forever. The Old Stone Church. We've been loving Christ and serving city since 1820.